that this is the mic behind that, please. Yeah, and it, it, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to be here, and it's always a pleasure to, uh, to be part of the American University, even though I'm not an AUC graduate, yet, you know, uh, it's always a soft spot for me. Um, let me just, you know, uh, briefly uh, talk about what, more of a situation analysis on wh where we are today. Uh, I believe that uh, Egypt has uh, been undergoing quite a massive reform, as we all have witnessed, and this seems to start, this seems to be kicking in well these days. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, for the first time we're seeing a positive sentiment from American investors, something that we haven't witnessed for almost seven years. And the interesting thing, you know, that this uh, sentiment is only about three or four months old, you know, I mean, going back a few months back, uh, I mean, Egypt was not even on the map. Over the last uh, four or five weeks, the frequency of companies coming and inquiring about the investment climate in Egypt, searching for opportunities has been accelerating. And this is, again, a phenomenon that we cannot override. It seems to be that the word or the reform in Egypt is starting to catch up in the United States because the United States is characterized by being a different continent, unlike Europe where we have uh, more of a mutual interest in many different aspects, you know. So, I mean, I believe that this is an opportunity that we have to start looking at carefully and capitalize on. Having said that, you know, the reform agenda is still going on. I mean, we're seeing a lot of positive signs these days, you know, in many different aspects, uh, notably uh, about opening up several private, several public sectors to the investments, to, to private investments. We're seeing that when it comes to the Gas Act and allowing private companies to break the monopoly of the government when it comes to natural gas. Lately, you know, we're seeing a similar trajectory when it comes to the Mining Act, which again will mimic the same uh, reform that the natural gas has witnessed and opening up more than almost 90% of our virgin land, which is unutilized, rich with min minerals, is finally going to be on track. Let alone there are other significant uh, reform indicators in other different areas, and I think it's all complementary. Revisiting the NGO law again, uh, whether that has been uh, internal pressure or outside pressure, you know, but the mere fact of talking about a new NGO law in view of the infamous law that we had, again, is a positive sign that we are starting to open up in this direction again. Another significant uh, uh, law that is just passed a week ago in the parliament, which is the Federation of Industries law, it's a landmark because it's for the first time we're going to have an elected board rather than having a nominated board by the government. So in reality, this is one of the more significant civil society institutions that is going to be completely weaned from the government. Again, you have to read between the lines. This has a lot more significance than the law itself. So having said that, you know, uh, uh, I would like to also mention that the reform agenda, when it had to do with the subsidies, when it had to do with the, with the, with the, with the legislative agenda, you know, has been more than impressive. But the question is going to be how are we going to implement that? But let me put another thing that has a lot of, a more of a geopolitical aspect to the country. There is an interesting uh, uh, remark or sentiment that Egypt is being perceived as probably the more stable, more reliable country in the region. The volatility in the region when it comes to the political aspect, you know, let alone countries like Turkey, and we know the problems with Turkey, Saudi Arabia lately is not a favored country, you know, in view of what we have been happening over the last few years, few couple of years. The Gulf, where the economies are to a great extent tied up to the oil industry. The one country that is not suffering from a Dutch disease is Egypt in the region. 
And I think after the reform agenda that has been extremely aggressive in many different ways, uh, Egypt is still perceived as politically and socially and uh, stable. And the safety aspect, again, has been exemplified by the resurgence or the coming back of the tourism. And we're going to see, uh, have the Minister of Tourism tell us, tell us more about that. So there are a lot of diff many signs that more or less encourage investors to start looking at Egypt, you know. Uh, and in many different ways, I'd have to say that also uh, we, we keep hearing from different diplomatic sources that the profile, the regional profile of Egypt uh, has risen quite significantly over the last year. The question is that, is that enough? Is that enough to put Egypt back on track uh, or not? The thing is, it's not enough. There's so much homework to be done. And I, had, I, had, I made it a point to start the introduction by talking about the positives and talking about the positive trajectory that needs to be carried through. Yet, when we look at our ranking and the, doing, the World Bank doing business report, we're still lagging behind. It's true that our ranking improved in the latest report, but we're still way behind. The competitiveness report by the World Economic Forum, you know, is still lagging behind. And investors, when they look at countries and compete, uh, who are competing for their money, they look at these reports. And this is something that has to be, is, that really needs to be addressed. Why so? Because, again, despite the reform that took place, you know, the implementation process is still lagging behind. And let me uh, uh, just brief you quickly. As, uh, as uh, the business community, uh, the Federation of Industries, in collaboration with the American Chamber and the Egyptian Center for Economic Studies, has come up, is coming up with a, a paper or a white paper or a proposal from the perspective of the business community of what needs to be done to more or less jumpstart the reform agenda. Uh, from a business perspective, you know, I mean, and this is something of significance because we need to look at the nitty gritties. I mean, the top line issues, I mean, have been addressed and are being addressed, yet the devil lies in the details. When we start talking about uh, the, our ranking in the doing business report when it comes to international trade, we're probably one of the worst. Why? Because I'll just give you some statistics, you know. To clear goods in Egypt, on average, it takes 16 days. To clear goods in the OECD, it is four hours. So the gap is huge. Doing business is about swift and quick inflows and outflows of goods in the country. Without that, it's a major hurdle, you know, that scares investors. When we talk about a cost of clearing a container in Egypt, it takes $1,000 to clear a container. OECD countries is about $35. And by the way, these statistics are from the latest report that we got from the World Bank. We knew it, but now we have evidence that it's being communicated from a reliable and credible entity. When we talk about the tax collection system, you know, that is to a great extent extremely gray in violation of the existing laws. Very presumptive. You know, again, an investor requires transparency and clarity. Without the transparency and clarity, again, you, know, you have a second, second look on whether they would like to come in or not. Land allocation, one of the uh, biggest puzzles in Egypt, you know. It, I mean, Investors are coming to the country and they cannot find industrial land, let alone land for other activities. Why? I mean, we're only living on a footprint of about 6% of our land and 95 or 94% is still empty. Yet, it seems to be a very dramatic issue when it comes to the squabble between different ministries, who owns the land, who allocates the land, and who does the land. And again, without land, there are no investments. When we talk about licensing and permits, and this is really a, a, a big issue, because every single sector and subsectors has a different set of licensing and permits. When we talk about, uh, for example, uh, 
medicines. Again, we, are, have, we have one of the oldest pharmaceutical industries in the whole region. Yet, you know, the contribution to exports is almost non-existent. When we talk about $500 million in exports, you know, it's nothing compared to any other uh, country, let alone India, for example. Why? Because the process of registering new uh, medicines takes a good three years. Whereas a country like Singapore, you know, who realizes that they cannot have a vetting process in examining the med uh, medicaments or medicines at large, you know, will rely on the licensing from seven countries that have the ability. Why won't we do that? And they register any new medicine in a couple of months. It takes us three years. On a fast track, it can take us a year and a half. The pricing system, when it comes to medicine, is the same problem. So underpriced that any country who's importing medicines from us would not allow this underpricing, you know. Uh, when we talk about cosmetics, every single item that needs to be, even if a change in the label, will require a permit from the uh, pharmaceutical institute with fees and with a process that can take up to three, four months. So, I mean, if you look at the shampoo, or I don't mean a shampoo, I mean uh, an eyeliner that has different colors, different packaging, each one of those will require a separate registration and a separate license. When we talk about uh, uh, other uh, challenges, for example, uh, we have a food safety authority that has already been in place, and this is one of the more dramatic uh, governance reform initiatives, you know, that is lumping up seven ministries into one entity that would govern the safety of food, and more, more or less of 14 regulatory in, uh, uh, in, uh, agencies under one umbrella, yet the struggle to get this uh, entity on its feet is being fought left, right, and center, and not only from the government agency, from the private sector itself, surprisingly, or maybe not so surprising. Industrial licensing, you know, again, it's, it's, it's one of the landmark legislations that took place where you just get, you just inform the government that you exist and they come and verify that you exist, you know. 15,000 licenses have been issued this year. I think th 16 is going, it's increasing by the day. But the vetting process or the verification of these, uh, of the existence of these entities is lagging behind because there is no budget for the industrial authority to have enough engineers to go and go on the process. So, I mean, it's just bureaucracy. So, in many different ways, you know, uh, I think our biggest enemy is ourselves, you know, the red tape. Red tape that is more or less like a cobweb of, uh, uh, I would say, a, a disastrous cobweb that is, in, is tangling the whole country at large. However, uh, I would have to say that it's an accumulation of years and years of uh, inactivity. To, 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 to believe that you're going to fix this issue overnight is really unrealistic. But for an investor who's keen to come to Egypt, you know, the mere fact that uh, seeing a positive or a real heavy-handed approach in solving these, these issues is enough in itself to invite investors to come. Uh, I would have to say that we're starting to feel uh, the importance or, the, or having this re sectoral reform that we have been constantly hammering on for the last four or five years is finally starting to come as a priority with the current cabinet. After the realization that what has been done did not attract, attract enough investment, uh, investments as perceived. I would have to say that uh, it was a bit unfortunate, you know, that uh, by the time any investor witnessing the reform agenda in Egypt will, uh, in many different ways, had to wait and see, to see whether these reforms will translate into political unrest, social unrest. Interestingly enough, this is one of the very few countries that this did not happen. And it just sent a, a very strong message, you know, that the country internally seems to be swallowing or biting the bullet for any good reasons that we can discuss. I mean, but I mean, the fact remains that this country weathered the storm. 
By the time we were supposedly there to start reaping the benefits, you know, the emerging market crisis more or less tarnished us as being part of it. And rather than having, rather than seeing more inflow of money, we're seeing an outflow of money. Yet the one country that has, uh, by different financial institutions, and we have Mr. Reza Bakir with us here, he can tell us about it, that weathered the storm has been in Egypt. But the interesting thing, it was, I would say, it was a blessing in this, uh, this guise because it was a wake-up call that the reform that has, under, that has been undertaken over the last three years is not enough. And now coming back on the implementation process, it's really the real challenge that we have. Without having too much, I don't know how much time do I have. I'm done. Okay. The last thing, you know, I mean, which is a positive note. I, I like to end it with a positive note. That while talking to the government in the uh, last couple of months, the, the intent of digitization, the intent of uh, 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 jumps or more or less bypassing the red tape by having an electronic government, it seems to be finally in place. I'm not, uh, I don't believe that we're going to stay forever to reform the country. There are tools and mechanisms by using artificial intelligence, mathematical algorithms, by having an electronic economy that can probably accelerate the whole process on a fast track. The good news is it seems to be that the government is picking up on that too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.